As I said, I'm Judith Townend, I'm Director of the Information Law and Policy Centre here at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. The Centre's research is very interested in the way that information flows through society, the relationship between freedom of expression, rights to privacy, the protection of national security, and in particular the, the current debate around state surveillance and communication interception powers. So we're very pleased today to work with the Institute for Commonwealth Studies on this, on this event around the new uh, prevent duty. So I now have the pleasure of introducing uh, Sir Vince Cable, our keynote speaker. Um, from the last panel, I think we've probably got the easy job for the day. Um, I will try and um, uh, I'll share the discussion afterwards. So, uh, Sir Vince Cable was the Liberal Democrat MP for Twickenham from 1997 to 2015 and Deputy Leader of the Liberal Democratic Party from 2006 to 2010. Um, and he was, previous, he was also the Liberal Democrats' Chief Economic Spokesperson from 2003 to 2010. And he, of course, was <coughs> Business Secretary under the Coalition Government uh, from 2010 to 2015. He's author of the best-selling book, The Storm, um, an ex exploration of the 2008 economic crisis, and most recently, After the Storm, in which he discusses the state of glo global financial markets. Um, but as business secretary, he also had uh, responsibility for strategy and policy on higher and further education, and was outspoken on, on these issues around uh, policy and legislation directed at counter-terrorism and anti-extremism. I don't want to preempt anything more that uh, Sir Vince is going to say today, today, so I'd very much like to hand over at this point, and thank you very much for joining well, us. Well, thank you, and um, thank you for inviting me to the conference. I'm already beginning to feel <clears throat> a bit redundant, because the last half hour which I ever heard actually covered many of the issues I wanted to talk about, and uh, Professor Gleaves' uh, final parting shot about the, the power of words uh, is essentially what I, I want to talk about. Um, perhaps I should just start by making a few disclaimers. I'm here to talk about quite a narrow area of uh, discussion. I'm not talking here to talk about the wider issues of terrorism and counter-terrorism. I want to talk very specifically about the link with the issues around freedom of speech. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, let alone an advanced lawyer. Um, <laughs> I'm an economist, uh, which isn't necessarily a very good disciplinary platform for discussing this issue. Uh, nor do I claim any particular knowledge or understanding of um, extremist ideology uh, or religion, for that matter. I suppose I fit within the general category of people who are semi-agnostic, semi-secular Christians. Um, uh, but, but I've always sensed a certain sort of irony in this position. I go to church quite often, uh, and I'm normally surrounded by very kindly, um, gentle people. Um, but the book that we um, take as our central text uh, is full of references to smiting and beating and grinding into dust our enemies. And uh, <laughs> are pretty competitive, I think, with the Quran when it comes to blood and guts. Um, so I approach this subject with a, a certain amount of skepticism. But can I, perhaps before developing the arguments a little bit, just explaining where I'm coming from and why I have a, an interest in this subject. Uh, I was, for uh, my five years in the coalition, uh, the uh, Secretary of State responsible for higher education universities. And because of that, I was uh, co-opted into the government groups concerned with the PREVENT strategy. I wasn't centrally involved in it, uh, but in part of the balance of the coalition, uh, that was one of my roles. Uh, and I became seriously engaged uh, when it became clear on the back of the counter-terrorism legislation in 2014, and more particularly the guidance which followed from it, that this had implications for the statutory duty which universities have to uh, protect uh, freedom of speech. And indeed, I blocked measures that would have uh, introduced prescriptive rules for universities governing extremist speakers and um, related activities. I was supported by my party leader, and that particular um, approach did not find its way into legislation during the coalition. Uh, what's happened since is the re-emergence of these ideas uh, in the paper this month, the so-called counter-extremism paper, uh, which does make it very clear that um, the government wants to now introduce some of the measures that were blocked in the period of coalition government. 
And quite apart from uh, my role in the coalition, I mean, I have, although I'm not a lawyer, uh, and this is not a specialist area for me, I suppose a general interest that anybody with a political background would have in how we balance freedom of speech against order other concerns in society. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in a, in a household uh, working class racism was part of the language of everyday life. I grew up with that. Um, I guess under the prevent legislation I probably should have been referring my dad to the authorities. But it was the, those were the values of the, of the time. Um, my first immersion in politics was in Glasgow, and uh, anybody who's ever been to the Glasgow Rangers football match will know that the chants on the terraces fall well within the uh, definition of non-violent extremism under the legislation that we're now considering. Uh, and having um, entered into a uh, mixed marriage uh, uh, with an Asian family, uh, and having a, a mixed family of my own, I've been exposed throughout my life to the issue about how do you respond to a range of extremist ideologies, whether it comes from uh, starting with Enoch Powell and the Rivers of Blood through to the BNP and related ideas. How do you deal with these things? So my interests in this are partly very specific, related to my experience of this particular piece of legislation in government, and uh, the personal interest of somebody who's been involved in political life uh, and wants to have a proper balanced approach to how we deal with extremist uh, language and activity. I just want to make it clear before I embark on the argument that I think there is an extremely important distinction to be made, and I think this, is, this came from the floor, between how you deal with terrorism and how you deal with extremism. And it's the conflation of these two things which seems to me so fundamentally dangerous in what the current government is trying to do. I, my own views on terrorism is I think we should be using the full force of the criminal law to anybody who puts us at risk of, of violence uh, and completely uncompromising on that. But that's not the issue I want to address. It is about the issue of non-violent extremism. And I think the problem here, and I think I heard a phrase from the floor questioning a few minutes ago, Somebody used the phrase, can't convey adults. And at the heart of current government thinking is exactly that, that there is some kind of convey adult which takes people from extreme ideology to terrorism. Terror is, is a consequence, and it may even be no more than a symptom of a, a deeper problem, which is extremist ideology. That's where the government's coming from. Well, that's the issue that we need to focus on. And I think it's worthwhile, I don't know whether you have this in the earlier sections, just reviewing some of the definitions uh, that the government uses. Uh, in the October 2015 strategy paper on counter-extremism, it defines extremism, it uses the same language as in the 2011 prevent paper, as follows. Extremism is the vocal or active opposition to our fundamental values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and the mutual respect and toleration of different faiths and beliefs. We also regard calls for the death of members of our armed servant forces as extremists. Well, I could follow with the last sentence, but the rest of it does beg a whole lot of very difficult questions. Um, Another very important definition, and I'll just again go over this from the outset, is the phrase radicalization. The government uses radicalization in a very specific way. It, it is to say the process by which a person comes to support terrorism or, ex sorry, and, not all, and extreme ideologies. So those are the two concepts at the heart of what the government is trying to do. And I think we just need to address this whole issue, and indeed that Professor Glee addressed it himself in his concluding kind of peroration, which is, is there a conveyor belt? Is there a connection, a necessary connection, 
Uh, I think where I would start by trying to counter that is raising the question, of course, that there are extreme, radical religious doctrines which have absolutely nothing to do with violence uh, and indeed uh, go totally counter to it. I, I had dealings as a politician uh, going around the country with people who were advertised as Salafists. Again, I'm not a, an authority on Islam, but uh, the people I met and who subscribed to what were called Salafism, which I think is quite a powerful religious canon in a country like Egypt, uh, made it very clear that they had rather uncompromising views, which I personally didn't find very attractive on a whole range of issues, including the role of women in society. But equally, they made it very clear that they were opposed to violence. And although they may well take a... Uh, a radical view about change in Egypt, for example, uh, they made it very clear also that they wanted to tell British young people that while they were in the UK, they should observe British law. I may have been misled, but that is my understanding of what a significant strand of radical Islamists are trying to say. And if that is genuinely what they believe, what they're trying to say, it runs completely contrary to the idea that there is a conveyor. Now, the way that the government tries to develop its concept of extremism is to apply a series of tests. And I don't know how many people in the room have actually read the 2015 extremism paper. Just to, could it just put up a hand just so I know roughly whether well, this is how informed you are. But the, the paper sets out a series of tests uh, which are, uh, include the following. Encouraging isolation, uh, justifying violence, uh, alien and illegal cultural practices, and rejecting the democratic system. <coughs> well, you know, I think one does have to say that as predictors or precursors of terrorism, these are not good tests. Um, <coughs> There are important religious groups um, in the UK who opt out of the democratic process. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness or a Christian Brethren, uh, you opt out, you don't vote, you stand back from politics. And that is something, far from regarding this as extremism, it's something we respect. Uh, and we are always courteous to people who decide for religious reasons not to exercise their right to vote. But in the um, paper, the counter extremism paper, one example is given of uh, Muslim radicals organizing boat boycotts as an example of extremist behavior. Um, I'm not sure whether following Russell Brandt on Twitter is a, could be classified as extremism, but I think he was uh, very much engaged in the same thing. Uh, I think one could say the same about uh, isolation and the demand for separate systems of law. And again, the counter-extremism paper cites the demand of some radical Islamists for uh, a separate system of law within the United Kingdom. However, um, I find it difficult to understand why this is an enormous problem. And as a member of Parliament for 18 years, I voted through several laws giving permission for religious minorities in the UK uh, to exempt themselves from financial law because of their disapproval of usury. We did this for the Christian Brethren and others. Um, I, I also recall turning up every Saturday morning to private members' legislation, and we voted through separate legislation. And there was a consensus of support for it to have separate divorce legislation to Orthodox Jewish groups. Again, I suspect may have been very much part of the pluralism of British society that should do that. So why should they demand for a separate legal framework be regarded as extremism? Similarly, um, the use of violent language. I've already referred to the fact that um, you know, we have in Christian religion something called the Old Testament. And the Abrahamic religions, all three of them, uh, have um, texts which are extremely violent and unforgiving in naturally what they say. And if you take gender segregation, which has become a very difficult issue on campus, 
and something which I, you know, again, as a kind of secular believer in equality, I abhor. I'm not sure that we should be too pious about this. I mean, I, Rick, one of my earlier um, steps in political life was becoming president of the Cambridge Union when I was a student. And I was president of the Cambridge Union only a year after a ban had been lifted on women belonging to the union. And there are, of course, clubs across London that still practice that, not for religious reasons, but, but they still do it. Uh, to which the answer is, well, you don't need an anti-extremism anymore, you simply enforce the law on equalities, uh, which make gender segregation illegal in any event. Uh, and then the concept of uh, promoting illegal cultural practices. Well, uh, for FGM, uh, there is already criminal uh, piece of legislation. Why should this be bundled into definitions of extremism? So just to pull all these threads together, I mean, I think it's very clear that we all have views, often slightly different views, about what British fundamental values are. Um, Gordon Brown tried to do it. Uh, he made a bit of an ascent of himself in the process, but it was a commendable effort. But the key point is we all have slightly different views about what British fundamental values are. And trying to introduce this as a set of legal precepts seems to me fraught with difficulty and danger. And perhaps just to conclude, the, the, the problem with the conveyor belt theory is really the lack of evidence. And I think, as Professor Green said in his concluding comments, of course there are terrorists who are very strongly linked and may well have been motivated by uh, ideology, but uh, this isn't not a necessary condition. It certainly isn't a sufficient one either. Um, leads me to question the whole premise on which uh, government policy is based. But let me just take a second strand in the argument which I heard earlier, which is about the limits to freedom of speech. Because I, I heard Evan Harris say at one point that uh, freedom of speech and the right to offend, for example, should be considered an absolute. Well, actually, in practice, that isn't the way our society operates. We have very considerable constraints on freedom of speech. Uh, the most obvious one, which uh, more philosophers have often cited is the, the classic case of being in a crowded cinema uh, and somebody shouts out that there's a fire, and when there isn't, and causes a stampede. That is you know, irresponsible behaviour uh, which does not permit, or should not permit, the use of unfettered free speech. We have uh, legislation which prevents, and rightly in my view, racial, the incitement of racial hatred. And after long and anguished debates in Parliament, I think it was extended to religious hatred as well. There was a reluctance to go down that road initially because uh, some Christians believed that other religions were fundamentally abhorrent and didn't wish to be prosecuted for saying so. But nonetheless, we now regard racial and religious hatred and the promulgation of it as uh, something that it should be bound by the criminal law, and um, there are restraints on freedom of speech. Um, in many countries, I don't think this is actually true here, but again, I'm not a lawyer and I can be corrected on it, um, very offensive behaviour like uh, Holocaust denial is subject to the criminal law, and that is an outright restraint on freedom of speech, and I do correctly, but it is, it is embedded in the law in at least in some European countries. And if we take the question of the right to offend, I mean, I was out there with uh, everybody else supporting Je suis Charlie, but of course, uh, many of us knew deep down that this was not very British, actually, because until uh, 2014, under the Public Order Act, uh, Section 5, displaying uh, cartoons in that way was illegal in the UK, not in France, but certainly here. And it's worth reminding uh, the audience of the phrasing of Section 5 under the Public Order Act, which is, it is an offence to display objects which cause, quote, harassment, distress, or alarm, and to engage in behaviour which is abusive. Before 2014, the British legislation also included the word insulting. Now, that was subsequently removed. 
Uh, but the, I mean, the very simple point I want to make is that the freedom of speech and the freedom to cause offence, which you know, in a loose kind of way I think most of us in liberal persuasion would subscribe to, are quite heavily constrained uh, in the UK and always have been, though they're being relaxed and no longer have a law on blasphemy in the way that pertained before. Now, the, the reason I cite this is because, of course, there is a lot of inconsistency in the way in which we do treat freedom of speech. And most of our judgments about the exercise of freedom of speech are political rather than legal. Uh, and if we take um, outright racism, for example, the issue which I've grappled with throughout most of my adult life is, well, how do you deal with people like in the 1960s, uh, Peter Griffiths and uh, Enoch Powell, how do you deal with the BNP and the comparable groups today? Do you try to silence them, lock them up? You know, and as, given my own family position, my instincts were always to be repressive. My instincts were to be repressive. But then when you reflect on it politically, this is actually utterly, completely counterproductive. There was a debate three years ago, for example, about how we deal with Mr. Griffin, the BNP leader, you may recall that debate, and after a great deal of heart searching, uh, the BBC allowed him onto question time. Uh, as it happens, he was hopeless, and uh, uh, even people who may have been inclined to support him realised that this was a vapid, um, empty man uh, and support evaporated. But it was a pragmatic political judgment as to whether to subject his ideas to the test of, criti of, crit of critical reasoning or to suppress them. And I think the judgment that we've made in this country, uh, which I support, which is that at the end of the day you should allow views to be expressed and to counter them, rather than to sweep them under the cover. And that's why I agree with the speaker from the platform who questioned the NUS uh, no platform strategy. Uh, he cited the uh, slightly comical case of Jermaine Greer, who I think uh, people are trying to ban in Cardiff because she has made remarks that might cause offence to what are called trans people. Um, but there was a, another case which occurred in Cambridge earlier this year where the uh, student unions were trying to ban Nigel Farage from speaking on the grounds that he was an extremist. So I think once we get into the way of thinking, that the best way to deal with extreme views is to suppress them, we get into very dangerous territory indeed. And unfortunately, I think that is the way the government is trying to lead us. If the government is successful in getting through legislation, which then in turn leads to guidance to universities, I suspect what will happen is this. The legislation and the guidance will be vague, uh, universities, being naturally risk-averse institutions, will err on the side of caution and try to stop uh, controversial speakers. Uh, they will then be accused of being anti-Islamic or whatever, and so they will try to stop other speakers of other persuasions. And what will happen if this legislation is pushed through is that we shall get institutions, universities, which are supposedly committed, and indeed under law, committed to the freedom of speech, uh, pursuing bland, uncontroversial debate, uh, driving underground um, <coughs> contrary opinions that cause difficulty. And that's why I oppose the moves that the government wishes to make today. Can I just make one, two final comments? I've been speaking quite narrowly about the role of freedom of speech. But the, there are two slightly broader issues which have been surfaced by the recent debate and by the government's proposals. The first is that the uh, bodies that are subject to guidance under the Prevent Strategy are not just universities, which are after all protected by specific legislation guaranteeing their freedom of speech in the 2005 Act, but to uh, doctors, um, prisons, uh, even nursery schools. I mean, the mind boggles, you know, the idea that, you know, toddlers for the caliphate, and so <laughs> some threatening movement. Um, but nonetheless, all, all of these organisations are subject to coverage under the Prevent Strategy. And the likely consequence of this is that people who attend them 
will feel, rightly or wrongly, that they're under surveillance. And we're already getting stories of schools uh, where children are saying they don't want to talk about issues because they may be quote, put on a list. Now, this may be wholly false, and it's very unlikely that any action would be taken, but it is suppressing um, what we'd regard as a perfectly healthy expression of views. So that's my first concluding point, that this goes well beyond university. The second is that under the proposed counter-extremism legislation, which is now coming to the pipeline, there are a whole lot of other legal innovations which raise very, very serious doubts. I mean, there are, there are, for example, the extremism disruption orders, <coughs> which you may have encountered or discussed, which are an application of the ASBO concept to extremists, so-called extremists. And our experience of ASBOs was not a totally happy one. We found kind of we find the criminal law being used to um, constrain people who have mental illness and all manner of other disorders that should never ever have been subject to the criminal law. Uh, but that now, it looks as if it may well be applied to the expression of extreme views. But perhaps if I can just now um, draw things to a close and so I'll invite any comments or questions. Um, repeat what I said at the beginning, I have no problem with tough criminal action against terrorism and the promotion of it. Uh, I do have serious problems with a proposal which is designed to suppress and drive underground people who are described as extremists, which is a, an umbrella concept that could apply to all manner of religions and all manner of groups, is profoundly dangerous and could affect not merely the freedoms traditionally enjoyed in universities, but in society at large. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Linda from the University of the East. Um, I just had a question about events and the role of politics. Um, looking at universities and the role of events in it, and that seems to be a very much of a community engagement and community policing aspect. Um, and if you take the concept of terrorism as an international the two don't really go hand in hand. What is the role of politics in guiding community policing or community engagement? Take one more question. Yes. Take one more question. Uh, Carl, I'm, I'm a member of the public. Um, in a way, <coughs> in a way, so I mean, it's a uh, culture evolving over time in universities. Due to the implementation of the that culture of the obvious. So just speak up yourself. Oh, sorry, voice. Yeah. Uh, in a way, when we get the uh, evolving culture in universities over time, due to the implementation of the act, you refer to the blindness of the culture that was come about. So is that the same as like the governance of higher education institutions is so okay that it will permit this culture to evolve? Okay, well on the first issue, um, I, I think I think in, in many ways the, the prevent <coughs> strategy started with good intentions. I think it was a genuine wish initially. Uh, to try to deal with the roots of the problem. I mean, clearly, a lot of um, people who are engaged in terrorist activity uh, did have some very extreme views. Um, you know, we had the problem with extreme speakers, and shabbery, and all that, that crowd. And there was a genuine wish to understand what was actually going on in the communities where this was happening. But what has happened over the last year is that um, what was, I think, a genuine attempt at understanding and engagement has morphed into something which is much more heavy-handed and prescriptive. Uh, and I think it's quite striking that people like Baroness Varsi, who sat around the cabinet table with me, uh, and was initially, you know, and was very good, actually, warning not to approach um, particularly Muslim communities in a um, crass way, 
um, but to engage with them, uh, and was initially quite supportive of the Brevet strategy. It is very hostile and warning of the dangers of this current and pending legislation. Uh, and groups like the Muslim Council, who have in many ways been quite helpful to government on straightforward counter-terrorism activities, uh, very, very hostile. Um, and others who you might well have thought of as being uh, you know, generally helpful, the Chief Constable of Manchester, uh, the David Anderson QC, who is the government's advisor on uh, counter-terrorism legislation, saying that what started out as you know, perfectly good, sensible, unintentional intervention it is, being, is becoming seriously counterproductive. So I'm not anti the prevent concept. I think where it's heading is quite dangerous. <coughs> I think I didn't fully understand the second question, but I think you were asking me about the government's implications for universities. Was that right? Maybe at the point about the culture of the university. Yeah. So then the thing you said about universities becoming a more bland place. And yeah. So, you know, the governance of higher education institutions is it so weak that it will permit a curriculum for this? Yeah. Well, it, you know, uni universities are not arms of the state, and they are independent institutions that you know, we often tend to forget that we tend to, partly because they've historically got a lot of their money from government, today rather less so. Um, we've regarded them as, an art, as part of you know, the state, like further education colleges and schools, but they're not. They are fully independent institutions and should be strong enough to police themselves. I mean, the reason why this whole issue has happened is actually it's not a generic problem with universities. There have been about four universities, Queen Mary's in London, Kingston, I think Westminster is another, where there have been undoubtedly well organised radical groups who have been operating within universities. Um, and the university authorities have found it quite difficult to deal with that. Um, but that's, you know, having stated that problem, I'm not sure that this legislation is the solution. Two more. Um, this gentleman here. Yeah, Robert Hoggart, London School of Economics. Um, I think I can agree with you a huge amount of what Smith said. Um, but, you know, before we all get too miserable, I think we have to remember that this is about our, our concerns about possible forthcoming legislation, yeah. not what's currently in force. Um, I'm not sure many of us follow the current uh, prevent duty guidance, you know, all the way through Parliament. You've got a morning in the House of Lords, yeah. uh, thanks to your efforts and into many of your colleagues, but also, as we understand from the media, members of previous and current uh, Conservative governments. Um, what actually came out of Parliament on the 18th of September is vastly better from the point of view of many of us, I think. Um, than what uh, first emerged in uh, December 2014. Um, and, you know, you could take a view, if you look at one paragraph which said the university, uh, quote, clearly needs to balance its legal duties in terms of both ensuring <coughs> freedom of speech and academic freedom and also protecting students and staff welfare, but you could take a view, but frankly, we're going to have to do an awful lot of reporting to HEFI as the monitoring body, but we're not actually going to have to change anything that we do in practice. Well, if that is how it turns out, then you may be right. I, I, I was trying what I said not to be too alarmist. Um, I was uh, describing um, the kind of extreme scenario where the prevent strategy does lead to sort of prescriptive um, uh, rules. I think what I said at the end, though, is that I think there is a danger, this next to the previous question about governments, that I mean, there is a danger that, you know, although what you say is absolutely correct, um, and that universities will shrug this off. You know, it's one of the things they have to take into account and they will be reasonably robust. There is a danger that um, you know, somebody could take legal action under these new provisions. Um, they get a mauling in the courts you know, for one reason or another. Universities start to become quite risk averse. And it's a, the general pressure in the direction of avoiding risk, avoiding I mean, I, you know, I've been a minister for five years. I have civil servants whispering in my ear the whole time, the minister, you need to be careful of legal risk. 
um, when they didn't want me to do something. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can anticipate uh, university vice chancellors receiving that kind of advice. So I'm, I'm sure you're right, we shouldn't get over alarmed. There is a balance of pressures here. They may not in the event, once it's gone through with the Commons and the Lords, be anything greatly to worry about. But the direction of travel is worrying. The direction of travel is worrying. And there is a worst case scenario in which universities do become seriously intimidated. Um, <clears throat> Shara Ali, I work at the University of Amsterdam. <laughs> I think what's, what's particularly interesting from the point of view of an AGI environment is how um, authoritarian, potentially, uh, they can become if they're misinterpreting or overinterpreting this legislation. And it can affect the culture in which uh, free speech, <coughs> and I happen to believe, that I think the point's been made already well made, that um, even if uh, there are threats coming from various directions, you would want to be able to anticipate. So, uh, for war is for armed people, as opposed to driving them underground. In so far as we can get these threats, uh, threat alerts through speech, we want to be able to confront and challenge them. Now, my worry though is that in the same way, you must have had some um, insight into how the intelligence services operate. And I think it's notable that in the previous session, I think a lot of the uh, debate, I think, was questioning potentially false appeals to authority. So, um, I mean, we've heard Mr. Gleese, uh, Professor Gleese as well, refer to um, various uh, spokespersons in authority. And I think one of the worries that the public will have, rightly so, if they're going to be sceptical and challenging, is what credence to give those people. And, and partly, uh, these, these functionaries may not uh, have got out enough, got around enough, and we may actually question their ability to judge wisely. But on the other hand, I think there is an inbuilt I think, uh, scepticism within free speech, which is that you have to challenge authority. So the authority actually comes from reason, right reason. It was Jefferson who once said that we're elected men to prefer a government without newspapers and newspapers without a government. I wouldn't hesitate to prefer the latter. So I think one of the greater problems that we face, which I'd like your opinion on, is how do we um, choose to defer to authority, whether it's the intelligence services saying, if you knew what we knew, or even within the authoritarian, potentially, structures of a university saying, we are better placed to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not you should, you should find yourselves uh, free to discuss uh, these people or free to invite these spokespersons. I think ultimately the debate is about uh, <coughs> deference to authority or the, our ability to challenge authority. <coughs> uh, I, I mean, I saw the very general, slightly land reaction to your question. When I did deal with the intelligence agency, I found them much more intelligent and self-critical than the popular view of Q and James Bond. I mean, it was, I mean, they're not actually like that. I mean, they, they, they're very conscious of the limitations of their own organizations. And the charge to uh, have more prescriptive legislation, I don't actually came from that source, to be quite honest. Um, I, mean, they, I think what I, what I say might be a little controversial or something, but see, what, one of the main sets of pressures to have this tougher legislation comes from within groups within the Muslim community, and you know, the Fulham Foundation had quite a big influence on government. Um, uh, you know, these people who, being extremists, have turned. Um, believe that, you know, in a way it's their experience that should guide the policy. Um, you know, rightly or wrongly, but, but that, that, that is in where much of the pressure came from, I think, rather than, you know, MI5 or SIS saying, you know, you've got to have these tough new plans. I didn't, I didn't experience that. One sort of slight tangential comment, and it relates back to the two earlier questions about universities, is there's a distinction between the universities themselves and speakers they have and activities that take place on their campuses and the student unions. And the student unions are separate entities in law. Um, I'm not terribly clear myself how these new measures will affect student unions, but, um, but they are somewhat distinct from the universities themselves. Question at the back then. Um, the uh, Labour MP has shot, uh, just 
joining the last point. Labour MP Nad Shah just re uh, yesterday said that um, uh, Quilliam and Inspire are two of the most despised organisations within the Muslim community. Um, why is it that they are the ones that are given the voice and given the opportunity to influence government and affect policy, as you just said, when um, largely from they have no grassroots support within the Muslim community, um, and even Majid Nawaz himself has claimed as openly that he doesn't speak for anyone except for himself. This question to if I can um, add to that question, I mean, we know that there is an um, industry around uh, prevent, that is, there are a lot of people making a lot of money, and Quilliam has got a lot of funding, so when we hear um, from government um, with regards to how they process, so it's when the government is asking people who are they're funding to actually give them advice, there is an issue around uh, what advice they're actually looking for to get the advice they want, so how um, in your position, would you be able to combat and see through that kind of um, uh, prism where you, you're able to dissect their actual problems with those people who are being funded by the government? The, I, I also welcome, the, uh, really welcome, the point that you made about the, in challenging this idea of um, the conveyor belt theory. And in that respect, Aaron Kunani, the, uh, the book on the Muslims are coming, is quite a useful thing that people might be interested in actually reading, where he talks about the myth of radicalization. One of the questions that um, um, I would like you to comment on is uh, what your views are and perhaps what you could possibly do about it is um, this idea <clears throat> that the climate currently is very um, racialized. The language is very racialized in terms of the way that things are progressing, in terms of the media, in terms of the things that are being said. So recently I heard a speech by George Osborne talking about radical this, radical this, and uh, how wonderfully radical this uh, uh, reform was that he had made. And I was thinking, he's a radical. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, then I thought, now if I made those kind of remarks and used the word radical that many times, um, I don't know if I'd be, be report, have to report myself to the prevention strategy in terms of the way things are going. And also the, this issue around, um, you know, you, you used uh, the examples of Nigel Farage and Jermaine Grigg, um, as being, uh, there's been outrage that these people have been banned from universities. It's pressured. Yeah. Pressure to ban them, sorry. Uh, there's been pressure to ban them for, and, and so on. Now, within that context, when uh, um, uh, white, uh, prom prominent white people are, there's a pressure to ban them, there is a sense of outrage. There are people like yourself and so on talking about it. But when pe um, black people, when um, Muslims, uh, any kind of uh, uh, group in that sense, when people are banned uh, for, uh, for other things, that out sense of outrage does is not part of the narrative that actually exists. And I'm just wondering, uh, what is it that you, can, you, in your prominent position, can actually do to try and combat that racialization of the narrative and that racialization of the language, and who's allowed to use which language? Um, well, first of all, on Mr. Osborne's language, he, he, um, he also talks about them being the Workers' Party, <laughs> the party the centre, which uh, uh, so the misuse of language <laughs> happens in a variety of ways. Um, actually, I think that the problem about the, your last point, I think, is the opposite of the case. Um, the, the danger is, I think, that um, we, we, we get into a position where it's considered acceptable to ban extremists because they are just too nasty and offensive. Um, and then in order to restore balance, we say, fine, well, it's okay, we, we'll, we'll stop the racist speaking as well. Now, that's the, it's not that, that, that there's some massive upsurge of support. I mean, when I was in Cambridge, students were trying to stop Farage. People were not outraged, actually. Uh, and, and it's easy to get into this rather lazy equivalence. Um, uh, and, and, and I think one of the ways British society has made quite a lot of progress in that subsectionally is people are generally outraged by racism, actually. Uh, would not have happened half a century ago. And the danger is that we say, OK, we'll ban that lot, and therefore we can ban this lot. And you get onto a um, onto this downward spiral where any form of radical dissent is actively discouraged. Uh, 
I find it difficult to answer the issue about the Quillen Foundation. I don't know a great deal about it. I mean, all I do know is having heard one or two of them, they are very, very plausible and very eloquent. And the, the mere fact that you've had people who have been at the extreme violent end of the spectrum and have come back to you know, mainstream opinion is very reassuring for the authorities. So I mean, that's all I can say. And then, I, I, my own instincts were that we do have to try to talk to, say, Salafist groups and people like that. And this is where, where the real test, I think. Uh, I recall one of my Lib Dem MP colleagues who represented a very mixed urban constituency. And she told me that in her area, the, the Salafist imams uh, were going around actively discouraging young people from getting involved in militant extremist organisations. And she, she found it very, very difficult to engage with this group, partly because of her attitude towards women. But nonetheless, that was the conversation that needed to be had. The problem with groups like the Pullen Foundation is that they validate our own views, really. They're comfortable. They tell us what we want to hear, um, or certainly what many people in authority want to hear. And the challenge is actually to get out and talk to people who, at first sight, are you know, not terribly you know, comfortable, but who may well have more authority within their communities and who are probably helpful in the final analysis. So, can I, can I, that, that, well, I think, can I to, or just to hear from a range of people, but maybe we've got time to come back to you. Um, any more questions? Uh, here and over here. Uh, yes, Evan Harris, I, since I was mentioned, I've got a question of a corrective. Um, on no platform, and I think we've got the idea of hypocrisy, it's surely absurd for people to call for no platform for Jermaine Greer or Judy Bindle or Nigel Farage or whoever doesn't, they don't want to hear from, just don't go to the meeting, and yet oppose prevent. And so my own view is that no platform is juvenile, puerile in fact, uh, irrational, uh, stupid, uh, student politics of the worst kind. And my view is, I don't know if you agree, that no one should be allowed to graduate from university <laughs> if they subscribe to this counterproductive, juvenile, hypocritical position. Um, That's name calling, by It is, I know. Uh, it's <coughs> in the context of humour. So, but, uh, but maybe there are people in the hall who think it is okay to pick and choose who other people should be allowed to listen to within the law. My corrective is that, of course I didn't say that there should be untrammeled free speech. I said it should not be uh, prevented by law on the grounds of offence alone. It's not just shouting fire in a crowd of theatre. We have libel, we have copyright, we have uh, uh, breach of confidence, we have incitement to violence and incitement to other crimes, all quite rightly prescribed by law in a proportional way. But what you can't do is say, if someone is offended, you will be purely on that basis, without it being threatening language, you will be constrained because those people are more easily offended. The opponents of those people will always be more constrained because they're more likely to offend people. And that means that the, the non-religious, uh, it's very hard to offend an atheist, but uh, they may want to express their view about religions. And it's also not right that religious hatred is in the same way as racial hatred. What we did in Parliament, you were part of this, Vince, was say that it will be lawful, will only be unlawful to incite religious hatred if it's intentional and if it uses threatening language, not if it's merely insulting or even abusive. And finally, Charlie Hebdo would not have been unlawful even under the old provision of Section 5, in my view, because there are defences about reasonable behaviour and it is simply not the case that as long as you're not going down Brick Lane with pictures of the Prophet on a placard, you know, so people have to open a book knowing it's there and there's a warning on the screen, it's not causing distress and alarm that's avoidable. So I have to say that we have to be very careful to, to protect free speech in this area. Finally, I used to be a big fan of Quillian, Magic Noah's, I consider a friend, I admire his stance. But I've looked into them and their links with the Henry Jackson Society, student rights and these neocon fronts, and I'm increasingly worried about where Quilliam are coming from. So I've had to change my mind on their 
and I don't think ministers necessarily understand some of the forces behind some of the people, some of the organisations that they wrote. Let's take this question over here and then give it to you together. Um, yeah, just quickly to follow on that last point, I should bring it. We haven't really heard people discussing the source of this um, concept, this conveyor uh, concept. Sorry, Mohammed Almazi, a legal researcher at Mansfield Chambers. Um, this idea that there is a conveyor belt whereby people are radicalized uh, by certain views, which then directs them towards violence. Um, there is actually a long history of this migrating essentially from the United States, from neoconservative think tanks from the United States into this country, of which Quilliam Foundation basically perpetuates. Uh, and I think it's important for people to know, to, to, to look into this. Uh, I absolutely agree about we have far too many already restrictions on freedom of speech here. Um, I was quite shocked when I first came to this country how readily people were willing to accept that certain language should be criminalized and banned. Section 4 and Section 4A of the Public Order Act already do that, and people have the right to complain. And people are prosecuted and convicted in this country regularly for causing offence to people. Just offence. Um, so, now to get to the final part, I just thought I'd mention that because we haven't really addressed that. We talk about freedom of speech. You know, in France, over 150 people were convicted for terrorism offences within a week of the Charlie Hebdo massacre. All of them for things people said, right? Young children, a uh, child who shouted out something, you know, arrested, prosecuted, convicted within 48 hours, right? France has even more curtailment of freedom of speech than we do here. Um, and Charlie Hebdo was constantly sought to be shut down by the state. So here's, here's the question. People keep talking about the possibility of what might happen. We're going down the road of what may happen. It may be a bit you know, unintended consequences. I think people need to look at what's been going on for the last five years with the PREVENT program, the kind of referrals being made involving children, uh, involving social services, involving the police. Universities are already bucking speakers and conferences, University of Southampton did, on Palestine and Israel. Boycott and divestment and sanctions uh, groups are already being targeted and have been for some time. So this, people need to look into what has already been going on for years, actually, frightening stories, rather than where it is we might possibly lead to one day. Uh, uh, so don't mean to be overly alarmist, but actually there are quite a lot of frightening, increasing number of cases. Um, a whole lot of things, maybe I'll just... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think on the no-platform policy actually, with students, uh, I, I don't think it's juvenile, um, and I think I, I remember how it came in. It was in a period when um, racism seemed rampant and was very violent and threatening, and I can understand why people wanted to adopt that approach. And as I said, I felt you know, personally threatened sometimes um, on my family. Um, and I, my natural instincts were to go down the no-platform route. I mean, I think, for the reasons you say, it is wrong. It is wrong. Um, I think they would be well advised to drop it. But I, I, I think one can understand the, the kind of instincts, the defensive protective instincts that lead people down that road. Uh, I'm, I'm not also sure I agree with you on the um, defence public order. I mean, you've worked on this much more than I have ever <coughs> Until last year, it was a, a you know, offence, causing offence was a form of offence. Now, you could argue about whether cases would have stacked up in court, but it was there on the face of the legislation, as this gentleman says, I think, it was distress. Yeah, but it also had, the, the, the word that was, um, I think, subsequently removed from the legislation was... Uh, insulting. Uh, you, uh, insulting, that's right. The word insulting used to be in the legislation until a year ago, and it has now been removed. But, you know, insulting is causing effects. And, and I think the simple point is that, you know, Britain has been, it, it's, it, you know, this is not part of the deep tradition of British free speech. We've always had careful qualification. Um, I think a lot of people would have believed that um, insulting other people's religions until quite recently uh, was something you simply couldn't do. 
but I'm not a lawyer. I think the comment that you made about one of the was very helpful. I think we have people on the same journey. Um, but the, and the final point about the existing practices and the way you know referrals happen. I, I simply don't know. Right? I don't know how many um, powers have actually been exercised. But the important point is that people believe that they might be. If, if you're part of a relatively closed um, community, feeling under siege, uh, and you hear that the teacher, the doctor, have powers to refer you if they think you're expressing extremist views that they may have heard at home. And then the natural instinct is to be in that situation and climb up. So it isn't necessarily that the, the action is taken, but you're creating an environment in which you know, semi-paranoia can easily break. You know, that's all the more reason that it's not going down that road. So a couple of minutes, if someone can kind of promise a very pithy question, this is our last question. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually, I agree with a lot of it. You said earlier in just the Q&A that undoubtedly, of course, where do you, some universities have um, issues with extremism, I think it was SOAS, Kingston. Now, those four that came from David Cameron's speech he gave a few weeks ago, and um, he got them from, I think, the extremism analysis unit in government. Um, but if you look at the press release on the Downing Street uh, on gov.uk, uh, the, the, the cases cited of students who... Um, committed terrorism related offences. I copied and pasted word for word, almost, uh, almost identically, from uh, a report by the Henry Jackson Society, which has been mentioned. So I'm wondering, basically, I'm not convinced that the evidence base, we've heard Anthony Lee this morning talk about how, whether it's 30% or 55% or whatever, of people committed terrorism offences have been to university, but basic social science, social science principles that correlation is not causation. Are you convinced that the evidence base that, met, you know, that Radicalisation is happening in university um, is, is, is happening, and whether perhaps actually radicalisation in terms of like we've heard the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which encourages non-violent activism to change whatever you're angry about, what might be actually the answer to violence, to stopping violence. Well, I think your question is a very good way to summarise it. Actually, I mean, we, we, the, the government are wanting to proceed with legislation that doesn't have a strong evidence base. Um, it's confusing. Correlation and causation, and that if you've summarised it, it's still there, and that's why that's what worries me about it. That seems like a good, good note to end on. We could obviously go on, but I'd just like to say thank you once again to Mr. Tim for coming.